guys, thank you for that nice introduction. I, I'm just a small town girl, really. Um, where is the clicker? All right. My demonstration point is, where is falling off already. Um, so hi, everyone. Small room. You guys can come forward. Feel free to you know, shout at me during the presentation. But um, today, um, my name's Blair. I'm with the UNICEF Innovation Team. I'm based here in San Francisco. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, how we scale innovations for social good, uh, but specific to wearable and sensor technology with our wearables for good challenge. But I'm first going to talk a little bit about, um, give you guys some numbers. Because this is, you guys are startups. This is Silicon Valley, and you guys like data. So 2.5 billion, that's the number of people in the world that don't have a formal bank account. 3.7 billion. By 2050, almost all of the additional 3.7 billion people that are set to inhabit this planet will live in an emerging economy. And 6 billion, that's the number of people that currently have access to a cell phone. And one more number, 3.2 billion. What does all this mean for scaling innovation? Because connectivity just isn't mobile-based. It's changing at an unprecedented rate. And 3.2 billion people will be online by the end of this year. Two billion of these people will be from developing countries. And by 2017, an additional billion people are expected to come online. And this is what people generally refer to as the next billion. At UNICEF, we're thinking about these people now. So today, I want to talk about how UNICEF specifically is addressing these changes in technology and how we're thinking about the new future. Um, we work in a lot of zeros. I say this all the time. Um, we want to affect, effect, and impact millions of lives, especially children around the world. But innovation at UNICEF means doing something new or different that adds value. So what do we actually do? We try to do four things, ask, make, scale, and explore. So ask. We ask and identify the most pressing concerns for children and young people. Make, we facilitate collaborations to develop meaningful and sustainable solutions. Scale, we scale tools that have shown impact and results. And explore, we want to look to the future and what's next. We want to provoke the public and private sector in the innovation space to think about ways of working together. And we want to make things that people actually want, not things that are just nice to have, but that people need to have. So how do we do this? How do you create a meaningful innovation? And to be honest, we actually don't even love the word innovation <laughs> at Units of Innovation. Um, but we decided to create a set of principles that we would address, that these are now adopted by multiple UN and multilateral and NGOs all over the world. And we sort of led the charge to say that you need to create an innovation process that promoted a culture of collaboration and sharing. And so our approach to innovation is based on these principles, which I highlighted here. So designing with the end user, understanding the local ecosystem, designing for scale, and using open source and open source data and being collaborative. And finally, as I said, we're always looking to the future. These five areas are the, the five areas that UNICEF's currently exploring from a vertical perspective for future technology. So we're looking at how, the, how we can prepare for new challenges that children will face in this rapidly changing world. Areas that may not seem mandatory now, but have an immense, immense impact in the near future. So if you aren't thinking about Malawi as one of your markets, you should be. And why? Well, I think it's safe to assume that most people in this room are into like the latest gadget and future trend. I mean, probably all of you have some sort of wearable technology on. I don't. I admit nothing right now. Um, but at UNICEF, shiny doesn't always mean better. And many of you guys are probably wondering, well, why am I on this stage? And what does that have to do with wearables and sensors? And UNICEF makes no sense. Um, so what we want to do and what we're trying to get the industry to do and why I'm at these types of conferences is because we want to ask you to imagine these possibilities and more. And so I'm here to redefine how you think about wearable and sensor technology. So what if wearables and sensor technology could do actually more? Could it save lives? So imagine this. And I'm going to set up the context of how we work at UNICEF. What if a wearable device could detect fire and immediately send a signal to a first responder or firefighter, saving an entire village or a slum? What if you had a wearable device that could track a mother's nutrition during her pregnancy, which helps her baby to be born at a healthy birth weight? Or what if you had a device, device that could even alert someone that they forgot to wash their hands, reminding them of a sim simple behavior change that could save their life? 
So now I want to take you a little through a little demonstration again to further re redefine how you think about wearables. So I had this on my wrist earlier, but actually, if I was a small baby or child, it would go around um, the upper circumference of their arm. This is called a MUAC band. MUAC stands for Mid Upper Arm Circumference. And UNICEF and others, we're not the only one, we didn't develop this, this was developed in the, in the 70s. But we use the band, and I'm just kind of showing you where the arrows are, I don't know if you guys can see this. But we use the bands, and the, the red, green, and yellow, essentially indicate whether or not a child is malnourished. So this is my favorite example of an analog wearable. It's low tech, it's durable, it's highly distributable. It has an excellent success rate for gathering the exact data that you intend for it to get. You can get a child into care immediately based on where they fall in the scale. It costs less than 10 cents to produce, and it's simple to use and requires no training or literacy. Even though it has numbers on it, because of the color scale, someone can figure out very quickly whether or not a child's malnourished. So, as I said earlier, while the trend for the newest gadget or gizmo is cool, where UNICEF works, shiny isn't always best. And so we thought, why not look at this growing industry to figure out how we could address these needs? And then we decided to actually do something about it. So what did we do? We launched the Wearables for Good Challenge a year ago um, in May, and we did it with ARM, which is, I'm sure many of you guys know, is a, they do all the design and IP for chips in 95% of things with a plug, and the design firm Frog. And we wanted to ask and put out a global call to action to develop innovative and affordable solutions to make wearable and sensor technology a game changer for women and children. So all of the entries had to address one of the pillars that UNICEF works in. So health, HIV, education, et cetera. There's seven. And the requirements for the design was that it had to be low cost, low power, rugged and durable, and scalable. So then what happened? Well, we wanted to push the industry. We just didn't really figure out how much we would. <laughs> but the community responded. Um, entrepreneurs, students, those people like yourself, makers, tinkerers, inventors, even kids, designers from all over the world. We had over 2,000 registrants with 250 eligible submissions from 46 countries on six continents, from Afghani Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, literally. And some people have heralded it in the press as the most inclusive technology challenge ever. That was our goal. We did not exactly want the like hipster designer in Copenhagen to win. Um, we really wanted it, these things to be made in the communities where they would be used. And so the Wearables for Good Challenge proved that. We proved that with making this te te technology widely available, that there is opportunities to affect not only the privileged, but also the underserved. So who won? That's probably all you guys are wondering if you weren't following it. Well, wearablesforgood.com is the website, so you guys can check out a whole bunch of things about all of the finalists and the two winners and sort of their greater stories. Um, in addition to, uh, we, we did a design handbook that was a companion to the challenge that allowed people, kind of gave people a roadmap of, of how they wanted to think about designing these types of products for this type of community and audience. So first up, we have soap pen. So people are like, what, soap pen? How is that a wearable? Well, the wearable becomes the soap, but it's exactly what it looks like. It's basically soap on a rope. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that it's a portable soap redesigned to encourage hand washing with incentivization by doing things fun. So you can, the soap is a residue. You draw like a sunshine or a palm tree or a smiley face or whatever on your hands. And then the kids have to then go to the bathroom and, and to wash their hands. Once they have all of the soap off their hands, then they know that they've gone through the five steps of hand washing appropriately. So this simple and ingenious behavior change that doesn't require any sort of also training or thinking, but that's also used by the child, which is very important. And if we consider sensor technology, and it gives soap pen great global promise. Why? Because students down the road at a school in Mountain View can use a soap pen, and so can those in the mountains of Rajasthan. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about this first, first winner. The second winner is Cushy Baby. It's a necklace, and, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the necklace with me, um, but it is a, it uses an, it's an amulet, if you can see it around the child's neck. The string also can come off. There's no choking hazard. I wanted to throw that in there. It's very important to the design. It uses near-field communication chip um, in order to send and receive information through a smartphone, creating access to immunization records up to the child's first two years of life. And this can happen even in the most isolated and remote areas. 
because the, uh, the actual platform that they've created can be used offline. Globally, one in five deaths or children under five are from are vaccine preventable. That's important. So by actually making sure that children are vaccinated all over the world, and this, this device is already being tested in India, we're showing great promise to put data in the hands for the people that actually need it so we can make children's, children get their immunizations and make sure that their mothers also know when their next ones um, are, are needed. Cushy Baby created an integrated platform that essentially makes medical history a digital, wearable, and social signal for immunization. So it also incentivizes people when the, the children are wearing the Cushy Babies, that, sorry, that's not my microphone, um, that they know that they, their kids have been immunized. So what was next? And I'll speed through this just in the interest of time. So we had these two great ideas and we didn't just like give them the money and win and say bye, and so they didn't go to what I call the like, leftover platter of half-eaten sandwiches, meaning like, oh, you made something great, and then, no, it doesn't go anywhere, or the, the cemetery of innovation challenges that, of ideas that die. We said, nope, we wanna make sure that these products get out into the world. So what did we do? Well, we made up our own, if you will, glorified accelerator, business accelerator for both of the business, businesses. It was four months, it was virtual, and we started it, we gave, we started about two months after the challenge ended, which was November of last year. So we started it in late January of this year, and we brought together this very awesome group of partners to help us do it. Effectively, both of the teams who were right out of college, et cetera, became startups right away. Um, I should mention that both of the teams are a mixture of students from India, Korea, and the United States. Um, but out of the 10 finalists, we had contestants from seven different countries. So it was a very broad group. Um, but the phase program that we put together, which I have the four, the four phases there, was designed to provide a foundation to scale each of the businesses and make sure that the products could get to the field and into market. I have to admit, when we started this, we did not think that that was even possible. We said it would be really nice if we could get these ideas from paper to prototype. And then we started thinking about it, and then we started seeing the ideas, and then we had all these people come on board and say, well, wait a minute, we can get them well past the prototyping phase, so let's do it. So we said, okay, and here we are. So we piloted the, the incubator, it just ended last week. I wanna acknowledge my colleague Kate, because she helped me with this, she's in the audience. Um, but we couldn't do it alone. We had to do it with our UNICEF colleagues around the world, because we wanted to make sure that we were developing field testing strategies that were appropriate for our offices. And we had to look at what, people had learned from the past. We asked accelerators in Silicon Valley, all of them, Y Combinator, 500 startups, blah, 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 you name it. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? How can we make this work? And they also helped, which was great. We identified questions and unknowns through the process and these partners. We worked to evolve and develop each of the products through testing and ongoing product iterations. I can't tell you how many crafts we had. It was pretty fun. And so we've now created a way forward and demonstrated a business sustainability for each winner, or slash now, effectively business, because they are each set up as businesses. And I can't tell you, unfortunately, publicly what's next, but I will say watch the space, because we're really, really excited. And it does prove the model that you can create products for social impact alongside you know, business profitability. So I wanna end by saying, I, I talked a little bit about our journey and why we got into wearables and where we're going next. And I really want to provoke you all in the audience to say let's make things that people want. I said it earlier, but we really believe that. We're not just gonna drop some technology or tablet into Tanzania because it's cool. At UNICEF, we do the things that aren't always that cool. We have to sit in those you know, unsexy rooms of government officials to try to get the ability to be able to push these types of products and technologies in places where they need them the most. And new solutions won't necessarily come from Silicon Valley. People are creating solutions in parts of the world where most people are used to think that they could only create problems. And I would challenge all of you to say that we must look harder. We must look to these communities to help us create these things alongside um, the needs and wants of, of what is happening in the world. We need and want to find out more about what opportunities exist. We need ideas from companies like yours that can bring access to information and opportunity to those at the last mile. And we need solutions that can deliver, as I said earlier, expanded profit and social impact. So I'll end by saying I'd really love to have you guys help us change that conversation. And whether it's done with UNICEF or anyone else or another organization, we do hope it includes you all. 
So thank you very much.